everyone, I'm Jensen. Thank you for joining me for some late afternoon tea. There are a couple of stories I want to touch on before we dive deep into our main story for the episode, which I'm actually excited to nerd out about a little bit. But before we do any of that, let me show off what I'm munching on. Today I made homemade peanut butter cookies packed with peanut M&Ms because why the heck not? I just swung by Rust Belt Coffee and picked up some iced coffee because I know I'm going to need some energy to get through some of these stories today. But enough with the nonsense, let's dive in. Dr. Jonathan Ross, the president of the Lucas County Board of Health, is now recommending schools begin their year virtually and that fall sports should sit on the sidelines until we can tell coronavirus, you're out of here. I just always wanted to say that. Most school districts have already released back to school plans and the vast majority incorporate some form of in-person learning. So, uh-oh. But Ross says the landscape is vastly different than when these combos first started, citing the current high number of COVID-19 positives and the fact that the county is still in the red category of the state's alert system. Now, the board hasn't voted on any sort of recommendation or resolution, and they're not likely to do so until their next meeting next week. But not long after these comments were made, leaders with Toledo Public Schools announced they would be, drumroll, starting the year virtually. So it seems the idea is already catching on. The school board voted unanimously to push back the start date until September 8th and to kick things off with the red light status, meaning students will be all virtual all the time. The current plan involves giving each student a device for learning and assigning them an instructor to report to each day. The board also voted to cancel all fall sports with a decision on winter sports coming on October 1st. And if you were planning on going out on the town this weekend, you may need to change your plans. Because the Ohio Liquor Control Commission voted just Friday morning to require bars and restaurants to stop selling liquor at 10 p.m. with drinks out of sight, out of mind by 11 p.m. Dwine said at his press conference on Thursday that as soon as the emergency measure was approved, he'd sign the order making it effective Friday night. Look, and I, I'm mindful of the economic uh, impacts that this has, um, but we have to slow uh, the spread of virus and we have to slow it down across the state of Ohio. Those of you who want to keep the socially distanced party rolling, DeWine did say that those getting takeout could now get three drinks to go per meal instead of the previous two. And let me just say, by curling up on the couch with a couple marks watching Jeopardy and tucking in by nine, it's not the worst way to start your weekend. But plenty of bar owners have voiced strong opposition to the commission's vote. Industry leaders have questioned an absence of data proving bars and restaurants are the source of COVID-19 spread, and owners voiced fear and frustration as the move could devastate business and layoffs would be likely. And on to the main topic for this episode, let's talk antibodies. What do we know about them in terms of coronavirus? Spoiler alert, not much yet. But I think it's important to have a clear idea of what we do know and what experts are working to find out. And I mean real experts, not that dude who keeps posting his theories in all caps on Facebook that you only know from high school because he introduced you to Tool. That was too personal, wasn't it? So my expert for this was Dr. James Tita. He's a critical care pulmonologist and the chief medical officer for Mercy Health St. Vincent Medical Center. So let's start with the basics. First off, antibodies are just part of the equation when it comes to fighting off the virus. Our bodies have B cells, that's where antibody babies come from. So your B cells make the antibodies in response to some sort of invader like bacteria. In fact, bacterial infections are sort of like their specialty. So the antibody is like, hey, intruder alert, globs onto the bacteria and the other parts of your immune system like white blood cells zero in and denatralize the threat. Pretty cool, right? But we also have T cells, and honestly, these bad boys are what do a better job of fighting off viruses like coronavirus. But if T cells are doing most of the muscle, then why are we testing for antibodies? While T cells generally fight viruses, they also react to a number of other invaders. And T cells aren't just bopping around with name tags that read Rona on the front. They could be fighting the flu or the cold or a whole variety of other things. We do test for antibodies though, because when they cling to those invaders, scientists can ID what invader they globbed onto. So basically we can tell when an antibody's battled coronavirus, but with T cells, we have no idea. But if you've tested positive for COVID-19 antibodies, congratulations, you are likely infected at some point. And if you've tested negative for COVID-19 antibodies, well, there's still a chance that you could have been infected too. Tita said that there were a number of patients with confirmed positive cases who later tested negative for antibodies. Are they still immune? Well, Tita said, maybe. He explained that it could just be that their T cells were putting in overtime and their antibodies had less of a response. 
but again, we can't really measure exactly what the T cells were up to, so it's kind of difficult to tell. The good news is reinfection at this point is still pretty rare, but how long do we stay immune to coronavirus? Shocker, we still don't know that yet. The problem is this has really only been on people's radar for about seven months, so it may take some time to get to know these things. For instance, immunity for the measles is long lasting, but pretty short for the common cold, some of which are caused by coronaviruses. Does COVID-19 share this particular characteristic? Maybe, but immunity for SARS, which is one of the closest viruses to this particular coronavirus, seems to last a bit longer. And I never thought I'd say this, but let's hope this is like SARS. And in terms of a second wave, well, that's all up in the air too. We won't technically be out of the first wave until we crush this thing down to extremely low levels for a while. And in summer, when things typically die down, we're back to peak levels. So who knows what will happen in the future? And come winter time, we will also be battling the flu. But the one weakness the virus has is that it can't swim further than six feet. So Tita said that as long as we stay apart, minimize the amount of aerosol we create and stay out of crowds, we'll be in pretty good shape for a good old fashioned coronavirus beatdown. But that is all I have for you today. If you need more information on any of the topics we discussed, including the recipe for my peanut butter M&M peanut butter cookies, I have all of that ready for you in a link in the description of this video. And if you like this and you wanna keep on sipping tea with me, please go and like that button that you're supposed to like and hit subscribe. Make me feel like someone is out there watching. But with all of that being said, I hope you get out there, make informed decisions, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>